Hello, my name is uh, Reggie Vanderveen. I'm a transitions consultant for the Snyder Group, which is a division of uh, Henry Schein Professional Practice Transitions. Uh, I'm here today to talk about associates positions and uh, what makes them work and what makes them fail. Uh, this is another great example of uh, the Michigan Dental Association's um, member benefit uh, program that they have, so uh, I'm very glad and uh, very fortunate to be here in front of you today. Uh, we will be discussing 10 reasons why associateships uh, uh, fail, and uh, there are several very important points. Uh, the last point, the 10th reason, uh, is something that you should pay particular attention to, uh, but we'll go through them 1 through 10 uh, during this uh, interview process. The number one reason why associateships uh, seem to fail uh, is that a purchase price has not been uh, determined prior to employment as an associate. Uh, most uh, associateships have a, a one to three year uh, buy-in transition. Uh, others can go as long as three to five years, but those things have to be known up front. Usually what happens is that uh, uh, the dentist that uh, believes they need an associate uh, just goes ahead and starts the process of interviewing. Uh, before they even have an appraisal done on their practice. Many times what will happen is that an associate uh, will come into a practice without an appraisal done and uh, one to three years later they're getting ready to buy in but uh, quite frankly if you haven't uh, agreed upon a pur purchase price to begin with the chances of uh, that happening uh, are very slim. In fact our experience shows us that only one out of ten uh, will succeed. The second real reason why associateships don't work out very well uh, and don't end up in a successful transition is that uh, many of the uh, details of the arrangement haven't been put in writing. So be sure that everything is done in writing uh, prior to uh, taking an employment agreement with a, a senior uh, dentist. Uh, that's going to in increase the uh, chances of a successful transition. Two written documents are very essential. First of all, it's the employment agreement and uh, both parties have to understand what their responsibilities are. If you don't have that in writing, a lot of things can go wrong. The next thing that's the most important written document to have is a letter of intent. We need to know what the senior doctor expects of the associate. The associate has to understand exactly what they have to do and therefore you're going to have a better chance of being able to transition uh, from an associate position into either a partner or a full owner of the practice. The third reason that uh, won't lead to a successful transition is the fact that there's insufficient uh, patient base and there's not enough uh, new patient flow in a practice. So when an associate is doing its, uh, uh, his or her due diligence, uh, they should be looking for some specific numbers. As far as new patient flow is concerned, you're looking for at least 25 new patients per month coming into a practice. So if you've got 25 new patients coming into the practice, and these patients are um, fee-for-service patients, uh, the chance of success is going to be a lot better. The other important number in this whole thing is anywhere from a patient base of uh, 1,500 to 1,800 patients. If a senior dentist has that many patients in his or her practice, there's a very good chance that you're going to be able to get a transition that's going to work out well. If you do have 1,800 patients in the practice, and it's a fee-for-service type of practice, then you're going to be able to probably sustain an associate for about four days a week, 32 hours. Without that kind of mix, then what happens is that the senior doctor doesn't feel as though that they're getting enough uh, patient flow in their book uh, and uh, the associate ultimately suffers in that. The fourth reason that we find that uh, doesn't lead to a successful transition uh, seems to stem around the fact that there's an incompatibility between the practitioners. Uh, when a young associate comes into a practice, many times they are interested in doing things that uh, the older or senior dentist doesn't have um, uh, in their patient base. So in other words, if, a associate, if an associate is really interested in just doing composite restorations and you have an older doctor who's uh, just used to doing amalgams, that could be a little bit of an inconsistency as far as philosophy is concerned, as far as uh, patient uh, provision of services are concerned. So um, sometimes that can lead to uh, um, uh, disagreements and uh, it can uh, harm the ability to become uh, a successful associate in any given practice. 
The fifth reason that we see um, crop up from time to time is the fact that uh, there's a failure to identify um, or even execute uh, a buy-in, buy-out arrangement. In other words, we don't really have the time set and it kind of just goes and goes and goes. Um, sometimes that can lead to frustration on the associates part and um, when we don't have that type of thing agreed to in the beginning, then we're going to have some issues as far as uh, a transition is concerned. The sixth reason uh, why we see associate ships fail is that there's insufficient access to the patient base for the associate to work upon. In other words, um, the senior dentist never intended to turn over any patients to the associate from the get-go. Uh, that can be a huge problem and you'll know that in a very, very short period of time whether or not the senior dentist is willing to go ahead and start to allow the associate to gain access to that uh, patient base. And remember that a patient base serves up to as much as 80 to 85 percent of the goodwill of a practice. So if you're looking at a transition that's going to ultimately result in a buyout situation, understand that you're buying that access to that patient base. So if you feel as though that you're not getting what you need as far as access to that patient base is concerned, that should give you some concern. Although uh, there's a problem sometimes uh, gaining trust from the senior dentist as far as uh, uh, allowing the associate uh, access to those patients is concerned. Uh, more often than not, what we're finding is that uh, there may be some staff issues. Uh, there may be a hygienist that's not willing to promote the associate as far as uh, access to those patients are concerned. So the best way is to have some sort of scripted process in position prior to the associate coming on. So in other words, if we can convince the staff that the associate is going to have access to these patients, therefore providing services for these patients, it makes it a lot easier for us to be able to make this buy-in, buy-out situation work. If a hygienist uh, forewarns their hygiene patient at the time of a periodic exam uh, that they're going to be seen by the associate, then that works a lot better because then the associate can come in and say all the right things as far as as far as uh, treatment is concerned. And what we usually find out is that if we do find some treatment needs at that visit, half the time the patient's going to go up to the reception area and check out and 50% of the time, like I said, uh, they're going to take the first available type of uh, appointment. Now, there are probably 25% of the patients that are going to have problems with that trust issue and they're going to want to see the senior dentist. And then sometimes if you put yourself out there correctly and the hygienist has done a good job of bringing you into the fold, 25% uh, of the time they're going to want to see you. What we'll also see sometimes is that uh, if we have an overly aggressive staff that's really making the associate book look very, very good, uh, we'll see a little waning of the uh, ability for the senior dentist to see patients. And then it's at that time that both the associate and the senior dentist need to sit down and figure out how we can make things a little bit more even as time goes by. But in the beginning, you have to have buy-in from your staff uh, in order for this associate position to actually work out the way it's supposed to. The seventh reason that we sometimes run across the problems uh, revolves around the senior dentist's inability to let go. Now this may sound like the sixth reason that I just discussed, but it's a little bit different. What you need to understand as far as senior um, dentists are concerned is that it's a very stressful and emotional time for them. I mean, this is their baby. This is their practice. Sometimes they can't let go. So what we're really saying is that the associate really needs to understand the stress and the emotional factors that a senior dentist is going through. If you're able to see those kinds of behaviors where they, you don't see a lot of outside interest on the senior dentist, uh, if you see that the senior dentist is being a little bit too intrusive, uh, those are signs of uh, uh, a senior dentist that's really not ready to let go and move forward with a transition. The eighth reason that we see uh, pop up from time to time uh, that inhibits a successful transition is the inability for the senior doctor to share openly and honestly um, the business and practice philosophies that they have developed over the years of their practice. If you see a senior dentist that is in, unable and unwilling to go ahead and talk to you about money, uh, 
as far as production is concerned and collection, and even whether or not uh, they have a uh, decent retirement plan in place. Uh, sometimes you'll find yourself in a situation where a transition just is not going to work. So it's up to you, the associate, to make sure that you're doing all you can to garner as much information from that senior doctor. And if they're unwilling to do it, red flags should go up. The ninth reason that uh, associate ships don't end up in a successful transition are just basic personality conflicts. You may have a senior dentist that's a leader and is able to do all the things that are right as far as making sure that the staff and the patients accept you. Or you may have an overly managerial type of senior dentist uh, that you're working with that um, has hands-on on everything. Uh, you'll be able to spot that dentist because sometimes they're up front more than they are in the back doing uh, what they need to do and that's work on their patients. They haven't learned how to delegate what's necessary uh, in a transition. So keep your eye open for something like that. And then the final one is the dentist that is just doing nothing but dentistry and hasn't been able to share properly all the things that are necessary as far as running a practice is concerned. You'll know that senior dentist when you're in there. Uh, but sometimes those are things that we find out later on down the road. So it's up to the associate and the senior doctor to sit down and talk about those differences so that we can assure a transition that's going to be successful. The final reason that uh, we see from time to time pop up in a transition is the loss of control of the negotiation process. If things are written down at the outset uh, and you've had your attorneys look at all the documents that are necessary to get this uh, relationship moving forward, uh, then we usually don't see um, an over-negotiation of issues as they start to get towards that uh, uh, transition date. So in other words, if you're in a position where you have to have your attorneys do all your negotiating for you and place your demands in front of each other, uh, your, chances of, uh, your chances of success really start to drop an awful lot. So when you're having an attorney, look at what's necessary as far as the transition is concerned. Make sure that your attorney understands that they're not there to negotiate for you. They're not there to transmit your demands for uh, what you need in the transition, but that the attorneys are basically just reviewing what you and the senior doctor have already agreed to do. And that is go through a very strict transition process where everything is written down. So in summary, when you're looking for that last push over the goal line as far as the transition is concerned, neutral third party uh, facilitators like me, a transitions consultant, can usually take you past that goal line. More often than not, if we get attorneys that are trying to negotiate at that end stage, uh, we find um, dilatorious results. In other words, you just can't get over that hump. So what you need to do is make sure that there are plenty of consultants out there that you can bring into the process basically before we start the process. But even when we get to that end, Find a neutral third party that can help the two of you figure out exactly how you want this transition to go. And then your attorneys, we're not telling anybody not to get an attorney, but what we're saying is then your attorneys can basically review the documents, propose changes for the parties to review, and then put that process all together so that you can have a successful uh, transition.